All right, so as for owls, so, you know, they're one of the most widely recognized and popular groups of animals in the world, and they occur on all continents except Antarctica. Now, in order to communicate with each other at night or in low light levels, they've evolved these unique low-frequency vocalizations that are best described as hoots, toots, trills, and hisses. In the owl world, we kind of like to say the big ones are hooters and the little ones are tooters. And so, <laughs> so, uh, we're going to go from here. So I'm going to, during the course of this, I'll imitate the songs of uh, the Montana owls for you and hopefully provide you some interesting information. So what is it? What's the allure about owls? All right. What is it? I mean, everyone recognizes an owl. Even young children recognize owls. And they don't recognize other groups of animals quite like that. Is it that they look cool? Is it that they look smart? You know, the wise old owl. Or is it the hoots and the toots and the hisses, the vocalizations? Or is it something else? Maybe it's the big head, the relatively flat face, the symmetry of the eyes, the centrally located nose and mouth, and the funky hairdos. Maybe they look a little bit like us, and that's the attraction, but maybe not. Look at this silhouette here. Look at that shape. Everybody knows it's an owl, as I said. So people call me all the time, where they start me, and they say, hey, I was driving down the road, and I saw an owl. What was it? And I said, well, I don't know. Did you get any field marks? And they say, no, but it was an owl. I know it was an owl. And I ask, I say, well, did it have a round head? What color were its eyes? What color was the bill? And they say, I don't know. And so, and I ask, okay, did it have tufts on its head? What color were the eyes? What color was the bill? And they say, I don't know, but I know it was an owl. <laughs> and so, I believe them most of the time, because look at that silhouette, look at that shape. It's really hard to mistake an owl for anything else. So, how do you go about finding them, all right? And so, things to remember. Now, first, what we're going to concentrate mostly on is their vocalizations, the hoots, the toots, the trills, and all that stuff there. You want to remember that, know a little bit about the breeding season. Then you might set up a survey. And within the survey, you have stations. Now, maybe you just listen, or maybe use some device, and you try to elicit a response. But then you get a response. Now you want to go in to the area that you replicated, and you say, okay, now we've got to go in and find the owl. So keep this in mind, all right? They're going to be hiding in inconspicuous locations. They've evolved camouflage coloration and camouflage patterning to their plumages. And if you get too close, then they'll start to use behaviors to try to hide from you. All right, so you go in, you look around. Maybe you find them, maybe you don't. Maybe you find evidence, like these pellets here, which are just regurgitated, undigestible materials young kids call hurl. Maybe you see whitewash or poop hanging down from the walls or on the bottom here. So keep in mind here, now how you're gonna find them again is the vocalization. So imagine this. Okay, imagine you're in one of Montana's many ghost towns or hanging around a bunch of old buildings and you're walking around with a friend and then you hear in the evening, shh, shh, shh. You say, gosh, it's gotta be an owl. But would you see that brown owl sitting up there with his round head, brown eyes and a white bill staring down at you? All right, okay, so now you're skiing over here at Bridger Bowl, and you stop and take a break, and it's getting towards the evening, and you hear. This is dry. <laughs> Would you see that boreal owl sitting up there, round head, yellow eyes, and a white bill looking at you? Or now you're down in the Bitterroot since a warm June evening, you're hiking down the trail and you take a break and you hear. Would you see that little flame let it out with its tufts, brown eyes, and a gray bill staring at you? Now you're over here and you're over in the crazies, you're going out to pick morales early in the season here, and you hear. And you hear. Can't get it. Okay, next you're now here. You're over MSU campus, all right? So you're hiking through campus here, and you hear, 
Would you see that great horned owl sitting up in the tree with its tufts, yellow eyes, black bill puffing out its white throat patch as it hoots? And then your friend says, hey, I heard that male great horned owls have a deeper voice than females. Well, maybe you have a pair nesting on campus. All right, now you're over in Livingston here, and you're getting ready to go on a fishing trip, and you're hanging out drinking coffee early in the morning, and you hear... And you're like, God, it sounds like a truck backing up, but there's no trucks around. <laughs> Would you see that solid owl with its round head, yellow eyes, and the yellow bill? Okay, so now you've got inconspicuous locations. You have coloration and patterning. All right, now you bring in this coloration and patterning. Now let's just say, let's just say you're up in living in Libby and you're hiking through a, a fir forest or something like that, and you hear, ooh, 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 ooh. And you look at each other and you say, it's got to be an owl, I mean, the big hooter. But would you see that round head, brown eyes, and a yellow bill looking at you? Okay, now again, you're over in Three Forks this time here. You're coming off the river, you've been there all day, and you're kind of putting the gear together, and it's evening now, and you hear... Would you see that western screech owl sitting up there with its tufts, yellow eyes, and a black bill? Next now, you're over here, you're in Billings. You're hiking along a trail along the river in Billings. And you hear. <laughs> Would you see that eastern screech owl sitting up there with its tufts, yellow eyes, and a yellow green bill looking at you? And now you're heading down to Yellowstone Park here, getting the last country car cross-country ski in for the season, and you stop and you pause and you hear, would you see that great growl sitting there with his round head, yellow eyes, yellow bill, and a black and white bow tie? Okay, you're back up in Glacier Park, you're hiking through one of the old burns, and you hear, Would you see that hawk owl sitting high up in a dead snag looking down at you? Round head, yellow eyes, yellow bill, kind of angry look. And then a long tail, looks like a hawk, but that's the hawk owl. Same thing here, you're at Charlie Russell Wildlife Refuge. For some reason you're sitting around and you're looking at prairie dogs and they're doing prairie dog type activities and every once in a while one jumps up and gives the alarm whistle. But then you hear... Would you see that burrowing owl sitting on the ground, round head, yellow eyes, yellow green bill, and its distinct long legs, knowing that it's going to nest in one of these abandoned old prairie dog holes? Okay, now you're over in my country, in the Mission Valley, and you're driving down the grasslands, and there, there's that owl sitting on the fence post that everyone recognizes, but no one can identify. And you drive up to it, <laughs> and you come up, and you go, I'm going to see this one, and it takes off. All right, but this time, it doesn't fly down the poles to the next pole line there. It flies out and it goes out over the grasslands. And it goes into this like elaborate flight here with this kind of exaggerated wing beast, almost like a moth or a butterfly. And it goes up and it rings up and it rings up and it goes up to 400. It goes up to 500 feet and it stalls in the wind or at Trish Ford and it goes. <laughs> and it dives and brings the wings under the trunk of the body. <laughs> Comes back up. <laughs> dives comes back up and you look at each other and you say, I think we're seeing the courtship fly to the shore at all. Okay. <laughs> Next. Okay, so now you're over in our Missoula study site and you're hiking down along the thickets in the old Palouse Prairie and you hear, ooh, 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 ooh. You know, it's got to be an owl, but would you see that long-eared owl with its tufts, yellow eyes, and a black bill staring at you? Okay, so we have inconspicuous locations. We have camouflage coloration and pattern. Now we'll bring in behavior. Okay, so let's just say you're getting close. The owl knows it, but you don't know it. So what they'll do is they'll start to employ some kind of behaviors to try to hide even further. So they may compress the body feathers. They may bring a wing across with a little white line down here. If they have tufts, they put up their tufts. If not, they'll put up that facial disc, just the edges of it to mimic tufts. Then they'll put their white eyebrows out and the rictal bristles around the bill. And there'll be two lines going down here. 
and it'll be like disruptive patterning is what we call it. But would you see that flamulated owl? Would you see that great horned owl? Would you see that female shorted owl on the grass there? You saw the male do the courtship play, but would you see her? How about the screech owl in the parking lot looking down at you? Or that great gray owl that looked to the right and then went back to business as you walked on by? Okay, and the same thing applies for our winter visitor, the snowy owl, but up on the breeding grounds. She's evolved cryptic coloration, cryptic patterning. Imagine if she was on that nest in the background versus the foreground, how difficult it would be to see her. Okay, so people say, all right, if I go out and do a survey, do I have to be quiet? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> but, all uh, right, so, so anyway, the, the owls can hear you. And so anyway, the owls, and I have to do this here, the, here's the facial disc. And so the owl ears are located right behind the facial disc. And some species are small, roundish holes, and other species are long slits. So most species have symmetrical ear positions like ours, all right? So the ears are on the same plane. But in some species, one ear is higher than the other. So in this great gray owl, the right ear is higher than the left. And on the long-eared owl, the left is higher than the right. Now you see the tuft up there. Oh, yeah, thanks. You see the tuft up there. Okay, that has nothing to do with hearing. Then you see the facial disc on the outline right there. And that long slit, that's the ear opening, and you're actually looking at the back of the eye right there. So those owls that have asymmetrical position of their ears, what they do is they hear sound source, they look at it, and they can calculate in the vertical and horizontal plane exactly where that's coming from, and they can sometimes go down through several inches of snow, leaf litter, thick grasses. On the other hand, owls with symmetrical ears like ours, they just make little constant angular adjustments all the time in order to calculate those angles. All right, so another neat thing about owls too, people ask, well, can they see by day? Can they see me if I'm walking around? Well, they can see very well by day. Now, they may not see like we see, okay? So owls in us, we have, you know, photoreceptor cells called rods and cones, all right? Now, think about you guys out today before you came in here. You're looking at a spring day, even though it snowed and rained, and all the colors that are going on here. So we're dominated by cones over rods out in the daylight. So we take the daylight and all this ambient light, and we bring that in, and our cones project a colored image on our retina. So we see in color. Now, once we lose light and the light goes down, we lose color for the most part. So owls have kind of solved that problem where they have a higher ratio of rods to cones, but it's kind of like the same system. The rods allow them to bring in any kind of ambient light that they can gather at nighttime. Moon glow, snow reflection, starlight, etc., And then they can project a brighter image on their retina and get along with their night activities. Now, it's hard to know if they really see in color or just shades, and that's, that's really not totally figured out yet. Another neat thing about owls, like us again, is they have varying eye colors. About 268 species of owls in the world, about 55% have yellow eyes, and about 35% have brown eyes, and about 10% have amber, orange, reddish, whitish. The function of eye color in owls is not really known, nor is, go back, nor is the one on uh, the colors of their bills. And so, it makes one think, well, if they can't really see color, at least supposedly, why do they have different colored eyes and different colored bills? So another neat thing about owls, again like us, is that that flat face, allows both eyes to have a high degree of overlap or binocular vision, just like we have. Binocular vision is kind of uncommon in birds, especially the degree that they have. Essentially, what that allows the owls to do is just see the world in 3D. They're really widely recognized and very popular, but they can be hard to find. Nonetheless, their popularity is very, very universal, and it's expressed in all kinds of mediums. I mean, it's in advertising, it's in art, it's in books, it's in cultural stories, fables and myths, it's corporate logos, sports mascots, it's even the labels of alcohol, beer and wine. And there's a countless number of collectibles and trinkets of brass and bronze and glass and stone and wood. The bottom line here is owls are very popular, people like owls, and owls sell. Okay, so some of the things that we've been doing from a conservation and management standpoint is trying to find the natural nest sites. Now, the owls themselves are hard to find. Now you've got to go out there and you're trying to find their natural nest sites, which is way harder than just finding the birds. It's easy to go check nest boxes, but to go out and find that natural site. 
So we go out there in the small, almost like this eastern screech owl, totally dependent on woodpecker holes or natural holes in trees. All right? But trees like this are often taken down because they're old, they're decrepit, they're diseased, etc. But we still go out and do that. Now, and we also go out and we try to find it for the larger owl species, like great gray owls, for example, who are, very often will nest in huge trees, but just nest on the tops of those trees. Trees like that are also taken down for a variety of reasons. All right. So what we do is we go out there and we try to you know, measure it and describe it so we get quantitative and qualitative data. And then we can take that information, provide it to resource managers or foresters, uh, private industry or private individuals managing their own forests, and then say, okay, we know there's reasons to take some trees down, but there's also reasons to leave some trees up. And another thing here. We know that birds in open countries, mammals, etc., almost all open country species of animals, grasslands, tundra, marshes, etc., deserts, are declining at faster rates than forest species. So it appears over the last 50 years that the burrowing owl has declined by 35%. Next, the snowy owl, 64%. The short-eared owl, 65%. The long-eared owl, 91%. Now, I don't know if this all is true, but we're trying to standardize the methods so that everybody's doing the same thing so we can get a better idea of the populations of those guys. Okay, got ahead of me. Now, next one here. Okay, so we've been promoting for a long time owls as icons of conservation, owls as indicators of the health of local environments. The snowy owl, the icon, avian icon of the Arctic is a classic example, okay? Now, the snowy owl's breeding season is totally dependent on lemmings. Lemmings are just these little small animals that kind of look like hamsters. Lemming populations fluctuate. They go up and they go down. And snowy owls and other species of animals in the tundra also react to that. If the lemmings have a good year, everybody has a good year. Lemmings have a lousy year, everybody has a lousy year. But you can't sell a lemming, all right? You can't sell grasses that lemmings eat. But you can take the snowy owl the avian icon of the Arctic, and you can sell a snowy owl, and also you can monitor it because it's easy to see as an indicator of the health of the environment. You can use shorter owls for grasslands, great gray owls for certain habitat types. And one of the other examples I think is good is polar bears. Now, it may be about sea ice, and it may be about the seals that the polar bears eat that are dependent on the sea ice, and the ice fish that the seals eat that the polar bears are eventually dependent on. But you can't sell ice fish. You can barely sell seals. Can't sell ice, but you can sell a polar bear, and the polar bear could be the indicator of the health of the environment in which they live. Next. So anyway, go out and do a survey. Set up your survey route. My crew is here with my family and friends, and we we're out one day, and we heard a lot going on. It's very unusual to hear hooting, tooting, hissing, trilling, everything at the same time. And we're up on the hill, and we heard it, and it was down in this area here. And we said, it sounds like an owl party going on down here. So we came down, we found a way into this habitat here, <laughs> snuck in, and we were there for hours. <laughs> Didn't find an owl because of inconspicuous locations, camouflage coloration and patterning, and cryptic behavior, but we had a good time at the Owl Bar in Salmon, Idaho. Thank you very much. Next slide, check us out. <laughs>